Tennessee, a man dies in a fiery car crash. I just ignited. Shaboom. The body's just burnt beyond recognition. A week later, his family starts getting phone calls from the grave. And that's not possible. We buried the man. Then, another man is missing. Charlie was dead. I know it. Police think there's a connection. We was all out to have a good time. What really happened that fatal night? December 15, 1998, in northeastern Tennessee. It's a cold, crisp night. Suddenly, along a winding country road, a car crashes over an embankment. It explodes into a ball of fire. Trooper David Garrison arrives at the scene. I arrived there, it was around 9.15. Arrived to a car still smoldering with the fire and rescue crew, uh, trying to get it distinguished. The fire is so intense that the driver doesn't stand a chance. The body's just burnt beyond recognition. It's just a big ash. I mean, it's just black charred. I have seen bodies like that before from where I was in the military, desert storm, uh, bodies burnt from bombs. And, that was a, the bodies I seen over there were pretty much intact, but that one, it was, uh, it was just a, a torso, basically. Garrison sifts through the wreckage looking for some identification, but everything had burned. Even the license plate is charred. As you can tell, there is nothing to tell me what state, nothing. Uh, all I had was these four numbers. He runs a computer search on the numbers to try to identify the vehicle there are three possibilities. One was a Ford Explorer out of Georgia. I can't exactly recall what the other two were, but it was totally different from what the vehicle, I knew I had a Ford Tempo or Taurus, or, uh, and I said, none of those match up. So Garrison calls in a criminal investigator. He dismantles the car to find the vehicle identification number, which is hidden inside the car. Once they find the VIN number, they run a second computer search. This time, a Ford Tempo registered to a disabled veteran turns up. There was supposed to be a D disabled veteran sticker right in this area. Of course, with the intense heat of the fire, it melted. The car belongs to a Joseph Pruitt from Stinking Creek, Tennessee. It's a quiet hamlet located about 10 miles down the road from the scene of the accident. Pruitt is known as a popular high school teacher and basketball coach, and a decorated Vietnam veteran. So it's starting to come together, this is Joe Pruitt. It's his car, uh, you know, this is a route he has to take to go home. But just because Pruitt owns the car, doesn't mean he was the person driving it that night. However, his wife believes he was. She told me he had a VA appointment in Lexington at the Veterans Hospital. She said, yeah, he, he had had that that day and had not returned home. Joe suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's what the VA treated him for. So he left at six that morning and he didn't come back. When police tell his wife, Marie, her husband is dead, she is overcome with grief. He had said different times, you know, that the worst, worst way that he could think he would to be to die would be to burn, burn, you know, and then this is what happens to him. And we were kind of all remembered him saying that, and oh, I just couldn't believe it. The kids were devastated, you know. It was right before Christmas, and then they didn't want any presents or anything, you know. Marie and her two young sons, Joseph and Jared, grapple with the death of their father. Meanwhile, police are troubled by the circumstances of the accident. We looked at the position of where the car had hit the tree and realized that if the car had actually been driven along the highway at highway speed, it would have hit way up and would have probably gone to the river. 
I mean, it's just a car over the bank, like it was just placed there with a helicopter. I just felt there was something not right. I'm out in the roadway here, and I'm looking for, like, a, like I say again, was skid marks, anything of that nature. Uh, went for quite some distance around the curve, could find nothing. As soon as I saw the car, I knew that it wasn't just an ordinary wreck. The doors on the car were blown out. In a normal car fire, everything melts in. You don't have force blowing things out. The medical examiner is called in, but has little to go on. We didn't have any fingerprints that we could work from. The hands were, the hands were burned to the extent, charred to the extent that the fingerprints would be impossible. I did the autopsy on what was left of the organs in the trunk, and then I attempted to reconstruct the length of the body by the bones that were in the body bag, and it was approximately the height of the man who was described to me as Pruitt. Dr. Blake has no reason to believe the body is anyone other than Joseph Pruitt. So he releases the body to the family and the police close the case. On December 20th, five days after the crash, Pruitt is laid to rest. The little country church where he'd been an active member is crowded with family and friends. In his will, Pruitt had requested that his good friend, Pastor Jay Huddleston, perform the church services. Joseph Pruitt was a, a very nice guy. He was good to be around. He's always friendly and helpful in most any way you'd ask him to be. He opened up our Sunday school a lot of times with Bible reading. I was grieving. It's kind of like a bad dream and you want to wake up. You know? Then, a week after the burial, several family members begin receiving eerie phone calls which made them wonder if their beloved Pruitt was really dead. That's next. Two months before the deadly car crash, 47-year-old Joseph Pruitt confided some devastating news to select family members and friends. As we talked, he began to tell me that he had been to a doctor at the VA hospital in Kentucky, and they had told him that he had a brain tumor and had less than a year to live. He told me he didn't want me to discuss it with anybody. Uh, he said, I don't want people to feel sorry for me. Oddly enough, Pruitt's wife Marie says Joe never told her about the brain tumor, but he did reach out to his 20-year-old son, Jody, from a previous marriage. Before Pruitt died, he asked Jody to oversee his will and distribute his insurance policies. The will states that in the event of Pruitt's death, an attorney named Taylor Davis will notify Jody and give him further instructions. A week after the tragic car accident, Jody receives a call from Taylor Davis. He is stunned when he hears the man's voice. He is sure it's his father. Jody immediately calls the authorities. The day that he got the first phone call, he was shook so bad that he just about passed out. This is what he told police. As soon as he spoke one word, I mean, as soon as he said something, I knew it was him. There was no questions, no ifs, and buts, nothing. Could Pruitt really be alive? Lots of times, it's hard for a family to come to grips with the fact that they've lost a loved one. If you can't look at them and see them laying there dead as they lived, it's hard for you to accept the fact that they're gone. Still, the police aren't taking any chances. Detectives immediately reopen the investigation. What they discover about this model citizen surprises them. Joe Pruitt was pretty much a con man all his life. It seemed like that whatever he had was never enough. He always wanted more. His friend, Bobby Canada, says he got what he wanted by using his charm. He was real, real suave, and real debonair, the way he talked. He was just, uh, he was real friendly, real friendly, a, a guy you could like easy. He was a person who, who, as we say in the mountains, took on airs and wanted to have a status in the community and, and presented himself as being a, a person of status and professionalism. It turns out that Pruitt's teaching certificate was falsified. It states that he had graduated from a local college 
he just put in courses for each semester and gave himself grades and 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 with and with uh, Xerox machines and copiers he was able to make it look semi-realistic and somehow got a hold of a, a fake stamp or made one up on his own that it was certified and sent that into the state and on its face it looks pretty good. From 1979 to 1984 Pruitt taught math at the local high school but one former student tells District Attorney Paul Phillips that Pruitt failed as a teacher. She said he never actually taught a single class. He would just tell them to look at their book or, or whatever. And of course, these children, they're not raised to question authority. They're proud of their school. They're hesitant to complain about a teacher. Especially a teacher who had coached the girls' basketball team to statewide victory. He went to the state championship for the first time in a great number of years. Three years after being fired for lying about his teaching credentials, Pruitt lies about his military service and manages to collect $30,000 a year in disability. He forged his discharge from the military and placed on there that he was recipient of numerous Purple Hearts and Silver Stars when in fact he was merely a mechanic in, in, in Vietnam and really wasn't in the combat role. He was probably drawing a bigger disability from the U.S. Army than most people make working for a living. Then, investigators discovered that Pruitt began taking out various life insurance policies in October of 1998, two months before the crash. The policies total one million dollars. There were about ten, ten, ten different policies. Now, the, the bulk of the money only came from two or three. Some of them were for very small amounts uh, that you just get out of a out of a brochure that came in the Sunday paper. Others uh, were were for small amounts where you would get when uh, you opened a checking account or had a had a loan with a mortgage company. I knew nothing about him. He had told me at one time that he had insurance that if anything happened to him, the house would be paid for. And I don't know what amount that was. On a call tape recorded by an insurance company. Pruitt is heard checking on a policy he took out for $200,000. When the agent tells him that he can't find the policy on file, Pruitt is obviously annoyed. So I'm not covering until the first premium is made. <laughs> uh, well, I'm just very upset that when I called before and that it wasn't taken down then. Well, okay. something happened to me. It only takes about two to four weeks for it to go into force anyway. According to Pruitt's will, his son Jody is to keep $200,000 for himself and put $220,000 in cash in a post office box addressed to Joseph Pruitt. The purported will really wasn't executed according to Tennessee law. It was handwritten. And this particular thing directed people to do stuff that normally wills don't direct. You don't put in there, well, take cash, go put it in a post office box. My dad was like that. He, he was weird. Like he handled things so weird that it was just... You just accepted it, it was his way. Me and my dad had never been really that close. And I felt that this was kind of like a bond to bring us together. His dad is here saying, I love you, I'm about to die, I have this inoperable terminal cancer, and I'll be dead, you know, in, in a short period of time, and I have all these insurance benefits. Now, Pruitt is dead from a car crash, not a brain tumor. I was almost relieved for him that he supposedly died fast so that he wouldn't have to deteriorate and, and go through all the pain that he was going to have to face. Just a week after his death, other family members also get haunting phone calls. They decide to record them. In this taped conversation, a man calling himself a state attorney, Taylor Davis, talks to Pruitt's sister about getting the death certificate. Is there anything that we can be doing? To well, hurry anybody up with a death certificate? Yes, yes they are. So that's where his uh, wife would come in. His wife could help us? Yeah, that's the reason uh, I suggest, you know, her, when they turn the body over, the certificate should have been there. Right then? 99% how it goes. They're under a six weeks obligation because they've already delivered the body to the funeral director. Police come to believe that the caller is Pruitt himself, who is obviously still alive. He was trying to prompt them to put pressure on whoever here in Campbell County that needed to be pressured to get this death certificate done because he wanted that money. He was trying every day, he was just pacing the floor, 
waiting till he made that big lick. He was going to be a millionaire. He's a tremendous actor, but he's not a good enough actor to disguise his voice well enough to call from the other side of the grave and not have people realize this is our dad calling. If, in fact, the phone caller is Joseph Pruitt, where is he? The phone company was contacted, and what's known as a trap and trace was put on all the phones down there. So no matter which one of the family members he called, we were going to be able to trace it. On January 7, 1999, almost three weeks after Pruitt had supposedly been buried, they traced the calls to this apartment above an antique shop in Corbin, Kentucky. It is only an hour's drive from his home in Stinking Creek, Tennessee. We watched the house for approximately two hours before they got all the paperwork done to come to actually knock on the door. When they do, a woman answers the door and tells police Pruitt is in a bedroom. There, he surrenders. He didn't say anything. He was passive. He knew he was caught. When Pruitt's friends and family hear that he is alive, they can't believe it. My sister called me on the cell phone and she said, uh, Joe Pruitt's alive. I said, yeah, all right, you know, and that's not possible. We buried the man. And uh, of course, he supposedly had been burning his car beyond recognition, so it was a closed casket funeral. And when police tell Pruitt's wife, Marie, that he was found hiding out in a woman's apartment, she is actually relieved. We thought it's a miracle. I guess they expected me to be angry at Joe, but I wasn't. Because during this whole time, I, I just, you know, I've been praying that it was all a mistake or, you know, just a bad dream. Pruitt is charged with faking his own death. He just kept saying he didn't remember that he, he didn't do it. And I wanted to believe, you know, that he didn't remember what had happened. A few months before all this happened, he would get up in the mornings and ask me what day it was, and he would say that he didn't remember, or if he'd been somewhere the day before, he didn't remember where he'd been. With Pruitt alive, the mystery deepens. Who is the dead body police found in the car? That's next. At the time police arrested Joe Pruitt for faking his own death, they were also investigating the disappearance of another man, 26-year-old Charlie Bryant from Williamsburg, Kentucky. Detective Eddie Barton talked to his father. He said, Eddie, he's a little bit slow. He said, now, he's not really retarded bad or anything, but he'll do anything anybody tells him to. He was trusting. He'd trust anybody. According to Bryant's family, Charlie had been missing since December 15th, 1998, the day of the fiery car crash. The last time I spoke to him was on the phone, you know, and that was uh, two days before he disappeared. He was thanking me for a Christmas present that I gave him, and I was going every day and hanging up flyers and questioning people and trying to find him. But I told them they didn't need to hunt for him, that Charlie was dead. I know it. May Bryant remembered having a bad premonition about her son when she heard a car pull up to her house on December 15th. He said, I'll go see who it is. I knew in my heart there was just something different, the way I felt. She didn't even hear the door slam on the car, and it was as if they forced him into the car. And that was the last that we seen Charlie. Investigators got their first lead into the disappearance of Charlie Bryant when they arrested Joe Pruitt. Although Pruitt wasn't talking, the woman whose home he had been hiding in was. The lady herself uh, told us exactly how it was set up, and it was set up through uh, Bobby Canada. Detectives called Bobby Canada in for questioning. After his first statement where he disclaimed any knowledge, he started putting himself at the scene of the crime. And he first said, well, he just picked Pruitt up. Police then asked Canada if he knew Charlie Bryant. Oh, he was a good buddy. We'd been friends for years. But Canada denied being with Bryant on December 15th. Do you remember seeing Charlie? Anywhere or any time? Not that I remember. As the questioning continued, Canada finally admitted that he had been hanging out with both Charlie Bryant and Joe Pruitt on the night of the car crash. We was all pals. We was all out to have a good time. We was all drug users and, and, and partiers and stuff. 
When the Bryants found out that it was Canada who picked up their son, they were angry, but not surprised. Neither one of us liked Bobby. Matter of fact, my wife ran him off several times. But, uh, he kept coming back. They said Canada only befriended their son because he had a few dollars. Their son draws a disability social security check. Never first of the month, he'd be there to pick him up, you know, to, I guess, uh, so he'd spend his money on him. In an exclusive interview, Bobby Canada told Court TV what happened on the day of the crash. He said he and a lady friend, Kay Doan, spent the day driving, drinking, and doing drugs. We just ride around and visit people and party from one house to the next in different locations. I'd probably taken two or three Xanaxes during the course of the day and drinking 12 beers. We'd smoked a little bit of pot too. Several hours later, the pair bumped into Joe Pruitt and Charlie Bryant in Williamsburg, Kentucky. That's when we started talking to them and they asked us if we wanted to go party with them. You know, I asked Kay and she said, well, yeah, you know, we might as well continue if we're going to go to party with them. That's fine. But first, Bryant said he wanted to drop off his truck at his house and he asked them to pick him up there later on. After Bryant left, Pruitt asked Canada for his gun. He said, Bob, do you have your pistol with you? And I said, yeah. And he said, can I borrow it? I want to be in control of what goes on tonight. You know, I'm going to be handling a lot of money. There's going to be some stuff going on. According to Canada, the stuff that Pruitt was referring to was a major drug deal that Pruitt and Bryant had been planning for several weeks. They had told me about it because they was going to give me the opportunity to sell some of the stuff and use some of the stuff. I smoked marijuana and I sniffed cocaine with them and we all just had a good time. We was all friends. Canada claimed that Pruitt and Bryant had a history of illegal drug dealing. They had done business for 10 or 15 years that I know of. Joe took advantage of him in drug deals. He had used Charlie in numerous things. For instance, Joe had owned some vehicles in the past and they had come up missing and he would hire Charlie to take them and do an insurance job on them, burn them for him. But the Bryants said Canada is a liar. As far as we know, Charlie hadn't met him. According to Canada, this particular drug deal came at the perfect time. It was getting close to Christmas, and uh, I, I was game. I was ready to uh, get some free drugs, get high for free, and, and plus make some money. You're talking about two or three hundred pounds of marijuana and ten or twenty kilos of cocaine. And if I would have sold an ounce of cocaine for a thousand or twelve hundred dollars, or a pound of marijuana for a thousand or twelve hundred dollars, and we're talking two or three hundred pounds, then I could have made uh, twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Canada also knew that Pruitt was planning to double cross the dealers because Pruitt had asked him to find a place to hide. So Canada introduced him to his friend, Linda Raper. He was going to be robbing these people, and he was going to be staying with Linda till he sold the drugs and stuff and left town. He was just going to be gone. And uh, he didn't want those people to find him, you know, that he was going to be robbing. At about 7 p.m., Bobby Canada, Kay Doan, and Joe Pruitt picked up Charlie Bryant at his house. Then, Canada said they all drove to Piney Grove Church, where Pruitt had left his car earlier in the day. When we got there, Joe and Charlie said, well, we're going to use the bathroom. So they got out of the car and got into his car, and me and Kay sitting there listening to the radio, and it's, it's nice out and stuff. And um, they got in the car and drove out of sight behind the Piney Grove Church. Canada and Doan waited. Five minutes later, Pruitt returned. Bryant was nowhere in sight. Joe pulls back up by himself and he says, Bob, I need you to go with me and help me just a second. So when we pulled back around behind the church at Piney Grove Church, there lay Charlie on the ground. And uh, when I get out of the car and look at him, he's, he's bloody all over in the, in the front of his face and stuff. And I said, what's going on, Joe? You know, what, what's going on? What are you doing? He said, nothing, Bob. You don't need to know what's going on. He said, I just need you to help me. He said, he's too heavy for me to lift. Well, at that time, I'm in shock. And uh, Joe's picking him up and dragging him over to the car, and he's like, are you going to help me or what? Canada said he helped Pruitt put Bryant in Pruitt's car. He's ready to go, and he says, follow me on to Jellico. And I get in the car with Kay, and I'm feeling real, real crazy, you know, in shock. And Kay, she didn't know nothing about what was going on. She's still having a good time listening to the radio. We're still going to party as far as she knew. 
In Jellicoe, Tennessee, Pruitt pulled off the side of the road while Canada watched in amazement. Well, by the time I pull around in front of him and look back, he's let his car go over the bank. Just lets it drive over the bank. It was in, you know, it was running and everything. He and Doan watched as Pruitt set his car on fire with Bryant in it. It's just, whew, catches on fire and he pulls my door open. It's a little four-door car and he jumped in the back seat, shuts the door and says, let's go, let's get out of here. I said, what are you wanting to do? Where are we going? He said, take me on to Linda's. You know, let's go on to Linda's. Why would Pruitt commit a horrible crime like this? His wife said she doesn't know. It's hard to believe that somebody you live with and, and that you have, your kids are with is capable of doing anything like that. I wish I knew what happened. As far as I know, nothing would be desperate enough or in, you know, to, cut, to give anybody reason to do anything like that. But she did wonder if her husband was having an affair. He was gone a lot, and I just believed he was seeing somebody. That's what I thought. We didn't have a perfect marriage, and, you know, we talked about divorce. We'd been separated and, and everything. But as far as hurting anybody I, or doing anything like this, I never, never thought he was capable of it. Throughout it all, Canada claimed he knew nothing about Pruitt's plans of faking his death and collecting a million dollars worth of insurance money. He believed a drug deal was supposed to have taken place that night. And he doesn't accept any responsibility for the death of Charlie Bryant. All I know is I didn't kill the boy. You know, I didn't hurt anyone. And I want to make that point clear. I had no idea that he was going to kill Charlie. My involvement was just being at the wrong place at the wrong time. But police said Bobby Canada was Joe Pruitt's right-hand man. He furnished the weapon that allegedly killed the Bryant boy and furnished transportation for Joe. So he was in it the whole thing. He's already in control of the situation. He has my gun. You know, he's already shot. Charlie, what am I supposed to do? According to Barton, he should have called the police. And I said, well, what about your buddy? When they started looking for Charles Bryant, I asked him why he didn't come forward, and he said he was afraid to. Where I live way back in the country and the people that I've dealt with and stuff, if you know about something, you don't snitch on people. You don't tell on people because you know and I know what the story is. Snitches die. On January 8th, 1999, police arrested Bobby Canada as Pruitt's accomplice in the murder of Charlie Bryant. A few days later, dental records confirmed that the burned body originally thought to be Joe Pruitt was indeed that of Charlie Bryant. And when Dr. Blake re-examined the skull, he determined that the cause of death was a bullet wound to the head. I didn't see the gunshot wound initially because of the burning and the fractures around the forehead and face. But who pulled the trigger? I did not hurt anybody. I haven't harmed anyone this whole time in my whole life. You know, I've never, I've, I've been in a few arguments and a few fights and stuff, but I've never hurt anybody. As far as beating somebody up bad, never. Bobby Canada insisted that he had nothing to do with the murder of his friend, Charlie Bryant. But Kay Doan, who was with Canada the day Bryant was killed, said he's lying. In March 1999, Doan became the prosecution's lead witness in a grand jury proceeding to determine who would be tried for the murder of Charlie Bryant. Now you see Mr. Canada here in the courtroom. Yes, I do. He looks like a lawyer in the three-piece suit over there. All right. Bald Gentlemen, on the top. He knows right. who he is. According to her, it was Canada who picked up the gas can that was used to set the car on fire. We stopped at Linda Riper's. He picked up a gas can. Now, how big was it? Probably, I couldn't really tell you. You're, you're showing about three foot, a two foot or something? Yeah. But Canada denied getting the gas. He said Pruitt had it. It was probably in his car. That's all I can figure. I didn't see any gas or anything. Doan testified that after they picked up the gas, Canada drove her to his cabin. There, she met Joe Pruitt. He kind of come over and said, this is Uncle John. He would tell people his name was... Uh, John, Joe, you know, different things. And I, I just thought that was funny. He said, he's got some trouble. He needs to go park his car somewhere. And we're going to follow him. Well, I went for it. I was drinking. 
smoking, taking pills. We was all feeling good. Getting high and drunk was about the only thing that Doan and Canada agreed on. In stark contrast to Canada's story, Doan denied ever picking up Charlie Bryant or even meeting him. A lot of times in murder prosecutions, you know who did it, you know the result of what happened, and you know lots of times why they did it. The exact mechanics of how it was done sometimes is, is never clear. Doan said she and Canada drove to Jellicoe, Tennessee. Pruitt followed them in his red Ford Tempo. There, both cars pulled over to a place known as Sandy Beach. Bobby proceeds to get out of the car. And I, I watched him get out of the car, you know, and get in the back seat. Did he tell you where he was going or why he was going? No. He gets in the back seat of Joseph's vehicle. Joseph's car, Uncle John. Minutes later, there was a loud noise. I heard two shots. But, you know, I was playing with the stereo. I never thought nothing like this, whatever, was going on. Doan claimed she never asked Canada about the shots, but she now believes they were the shots that killed Charlie Bryant. We independently verified from a resident that along in this time frame, she heard two shots in that general area. But there was a problem with Doan's testimony. She said she never saw Charlie Bryant on December 15th. Did you see any other people other than Joe and and, uh, and uh, Mr. Canada in the car? No. Even though she never actually saw Bryant, prosecutors claimed hearing the shots was incriminating enough. Kay Doan's testimony at the preliminary hearing puts the place of killing at the car. After hearing the gunshots, Doan recalled Canada getting back in his car with her and driving a half mile down the road. We pulled over to the left hand. And then Mr. Pruitt, he like just swerves his car like he's, and like he's gonna go down a bank and it stopped. I said, what in the hell is going on? Bobby said, no, don't worry, Kay, no problem. It's just a little insurance job. And that's when Bobby gets the gas can out. Him and Bobby push the car on over. No, I, I was in my car the whole time. After the, the complete splash of the gas on it, what happened? It just ignited. Shaboom. It freaked me out when I seen the car go up. I mean, I was drunk, but it did. It woke me up a little bit. I had no clue what Joe Pruitt had planned and was going to do and everything. Joe had all to gain. I had nothing to gain. I had no motive. Prosecutors disagree. Our theory of the case, which we think is substantiated by the evidence is that that part of the money to be placed in the post office box was going to go to Bobby Canada. After the car was set on fire, Doan said that Pruitt jumped into Canada's car. She noticed that he had singed his hair and mustache. I thought I was just an eyewitness in a arson. I never dreamed of eyewitness in a murder. Then she said they all headed to Corbin, Kentucky to Canada's friend Linda Raper's house. That's where Joe hid until his arrest. Doan was granted immunity for her testimony. Canada said that she turned against him because she was pressured by the police. They arrested her and told her that I had blamed her for the murder of Charlie. And uh, that's when she got mad and aggravated. Is Doan lying to hide her involvement? During cross-examination, the defense pointed out that Doan had either lied on the stand or lied to police about whether she saw Bryant in the burning car. Do you recall telling the police officers in these statements that you saw two heads in the car? I recall saying it, but I was wanting to, in my mind, I was wanting to see it so bad because I was so angry with Bobby and Joseph for putting me in this situation. Doan said she didn't lie to police. She was confused. Buddy, let me tell you something. There's so many of them asking me questions, and my brain was so scrambled, I could not believe that I was put in the middle of something like this. This throwed me into shock. After I got my head together, I know what happened. She actually didn't say nothing or didn't know nothing. Everything she said was made up.
Bobby Canada said his version of what happened was the truth, and he took not one but two polygraph tests to prove it. I told them no, that I didn't kill anybody, and they said, well, that's true. The test shows that you're telling the truth about that. Prosecutors were surprised by this information. We weren't aware there was ever any polygraph tests given and don't know when they could have been given for that matter because he was in custody from the day of his arrest. Court TV contacted Canada's attorneys about the polygraph test which they commissioned, but they declined to be interviewed. Ultimately, the grand jury indicted Joe Pruitt and Bobby Canada for the murder of Charlie Bryant. Then, police made a shocking third arrest. Pruitt's wife, Marie. That's next. In August 1999, two months after Joe Pruitt and Bobby Canada had been indicted for the murder of Charlie Bryant, police make a surprising arrest. Pruitt's wife, Marie. She is charged with facilitation to commit first-degree murder and accessory to murder after the fact. Investigators believe that she has been involved all along in the plans to collect the $220,000 in insurance money that was going to be delivered in care of Joseph Pruitt. The plans for picking up this cash that was supposed to have been put in a post office box in Carroll, Tennessee, was switched to being hand delivered to a woman in Kentucky to pick the money up. Trooper David Garrison's suspicions were first aroused by Marie's reaction to the deadly car crash. She didn't act as distraught or she wasn't, you know, like you go to somebody and say your husband's dead or he was killed. She didn't have that major shock. And there is something else that troubles investigators. She went every Sunday to visit Joe while he was in jail. She was too sympathetic and kind to him to suit law enforcement. They thought that she should have been really indignant and she just wasn't. Marie says she is not involved in her husband's evil scheme. I knew nothing. I just took care of the kids and, you know, did what I thought I was supposed to do. She was a very traditional wife. She left all of the decisions to Joe. She didn't know anything about their finances, about... She didn't know anything other than what he told her. The defense says that the notion that Marie knows nothing about her husband's deadly plot is hard for the prosecution to accept, but they say that's the way it is. She had not been aware of any of Joe's criminal past or criminal involvement. I just can't believe that they can charge somebody that's innocent, that hasn't been involved in anything. It was a shock. They handcuffed me in front of the kids. And, uh, you know, they'd been through enough. This was one of the most difficult emotional roller coasters I'd ever seen a client go through. Uh, imagine believing that your husband was dead, then hear that he was alive. According to Marie's defense attorney, all the evidence against her is purely circumstantial. The reason she was charged was an effort by the state to see if she would ultimately tell them something that could be used against her husband and possibly testify against him. There is no question that Marie, like many others, uh, was a victim of Joe Pruitt. I don't know how you can live with somebody and not know them, you know, but, but you can. Now, Marie is starting to have her own suspicions about her husband's guilt. And she says when Joe found out that she had been arrested and posted bond, he didn't care. He would just say things like, and, you know, uh, I'm innocent too, and I, you know, so there's nothing I can do. This case here has definitely been the strangest case that I've had an opportunity to work over 20-some years in law enforcement. Two years had passed since Joseph Pruitt and Bobby Canada were charged with the murder of Charlie Bryant. Prosecutors claimed that Pruitt faked his own death by using Bryant's body and recruited Canada as his accomplice. Both men faced the death penalty. As prosecutors prepared for trial, they speculated about the defense. Joe Pruitt was going to try a mental deficient defense, I'm sure. Since his arrest, he had been very mysterious. The only statement that I'm aware of that Joe Pruitt made was that he was like a person with amnesia. He had, he didn't have any recollection of the events of December the 15th. His co-defendant, Bobby Canada, was more vocal. 
that he set me up. I, I trusted Joe, you know, he, he had won my favor. I, I respected him, I looked up to him. I never thought at any time, you know, I didn't know he was capable of anything like that. I had no idea. Prosecutors agreed to try the defendant separately. Pruitt's trial was set for January 16, 2001. But three weeks before, on December 27th, he stunned everyone by pleading guilty to first-degree murder and aggravated arson. At his sentencing, he remained a mystery. Joe Pruitt stood up in front of the judge and said he was guilty of the crimes he was charged with. That's the only admission he ever made. He didn't say how, why, what, none of that. 49-year-old Pruitt was sentenced to life. He will be eligible for parole when he's 100. His plea agreement stated that all charges be dropped against Marie. I was shocked to learn about that. Joe had shown her no concern throughout this whole process. He had shown, he had not given her an explanation. He was completely oblivious when she, whenever she was charged. He didn't care that she had been charged with class A felonies, that she might go to prison too. He just didn't care and he didn't offer her any further explanation. He just stuck by his story that he didn't remember. Although relieved, Marie is still angry. It upsets me that, that those, you know, that me being cleared was in the plea bargain and that it, it doesn't have anything to do with me being charged wrongly. Since his sentencing, Pruitt has filed for a divorce and Marie and their two sons are struggling to survive. Marie has become destitute over this matter. He has some veterans benefits that help Marie live day to day when that divorce goes through, benefits that Marie is receiving as a spouse uh, will cease. He destroyed our lives. We just stayed in the house for basically two years. Jared, I, he's kind of confused. He still really doesn't understand what happened. You know, he was seven when it happened. Joseph was a little older, and last year was his first year back in school, in regular school. He was homeschooled. You know, he was 14 when it happened, and he was popular, and outgoing and getting sports and he's just kind of like me he's shut himself off only a week after Pruitt's plea Canada decided to plead guilty to second-degree murder and aggravated arson the reason I'm here and the reason I took a plea bargain was because I didn't have a choice in it either you know I, I did what I had to do I was given alternatives and I had the alternative of life in prison with parole, life in prison without parole, or the death penalty if I would have went on to trial. Or I could take this plea bargain. If I would have had a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars to pay attorneys, I, I would have been here today for what I'm guilty of. I'm here because I'm poor and not real educated about the law and everything. It was clear to us that Bobby Canada was the helper and, uh, and that Joe Pruitt was the mastermind and was the motivator behind this crime. Had we had definite proof that Bobby Cannon had been the trigger man, then, then certainly we would have held out for a much stiffer uh, punishment his, in his case. Canada is serving 25 years and is eligible for parole when he's 59. Despite his sentence, he is grateful for one thing. I'm off drugs and alcohol now and I feel a lot better. I attend church every chance I get to hear about Jesus. But Charlie Bryant's family feels Canada got off too easy. I think he should have got the same thing that Pruitt got because he was just as deeply involved. Death is the only thing that would suit. They ought to get exactly what they've done to my son. On January 16th, 1999, the remains of Charlie Bryant were moved from Stinking Creek, Tennessee, where he had been buried under the name Joseph Pruitt, to his home in Williamsburg, Kentucky. We get in as nice a barrel as we could. And although Pruitt will spend the rest of his life in prison, prosecutors know he came very close to getting away with murder and collecting the insurance money. But they say he helped in his own demise. Had he went to Oregon and stayed for a year and got the money sent somewhere and let everything die down, he'd had a much better chance of making this work. But he overplayed his hand he overreached, so his motivation was greed, the oldest motivation known to man.
A pushy mother was determined her little darling was going to make it into the high school cheerleading team, but how far was she prepared to go? Creme Central reveals the horrifying truth next. Next.